There's an old expression, every political career ends in heartbreak. If there's anyone that knows that maxim, it's Pat Sorbera. She spent more than 40 years trying to get Liberals elected and had a ton of success. But despite helping Kathleen win to a majority government victory in 2014, she found herself on the outs four years later. That story and much more are told in her just-released autobiography, Let Em Howl, Lessons from a Life in Backroom Politics, and it brings Pat Sorbera to our studio tonight. Nice to have you here. You Thank know, you. It's, it's interesting. We've, we've obviously traveled in a lot of the same circles over the years, but I don't know you all that much, and you've never given TV interviews in the past. I have not. So we're happy to have you here. Thank you very much. Let's just establish this off the top. You have a second cousin who is much better known than you and has the same last name. Correct. The guy who used to be the finance minister of Ontario, Greg Cerbera. Um, did he get you into politics? No, no. As I explained in Let Him Howl, um, that when, he, when we both worked in politics, people would come up to me and say, oh, Cerbera, you must have got into this through Greg. And I would quickly correct them and say, no, I was here first and I got him the job. That is exactly, apparently in his book, yeah. he says he yeah. called Queen's Park for the first time and you picked up the phone. Right, right. And we had this moment of, who's this? Who's this? Which Cerbera could you possibly be? And we figured out the connection. Because you two uh, don't know each other that well, or we didn't, didn't anyway. No, we had only met basically as kids when our, when our parents uh, visited, when our dads visited, who were very close. Got it. Yeah. Well, let's get into some of the themes in this book. And to be sure, gender is a big theme that runs throughout this book. Yeah. At what point did you notice that it was mostly men on the ballot, mostly men with the fancy titles, but women did basically most of the work and got little of the credit. Well, right from the beginning. When I first uh, got interested in politics, as I explained in Let Em Howl, uh, I was quite young. It uh, was somewhere between high school and university, and I started working on the local campaigns, and it was all women in the back rooms. And I didn't think much of that because it seemed to me they were still in command and control of everything going on. I did notice we were first in and last out every day and did everything from cleaning up the kitchen and, you know, making the meals to making sure the canvases went out. Um, but beyond that, you know, it was toward the end of those early campaigns, I started to realize they weren't always at the tables where the decisions were being made. How important was it for you as you went through your political career in the back rooms to break that mold of sort of doing most of the work but getting little of the credit or the title? I don't think I ever broke that mold. I, I still do the lion's share of the work in any campaign I'm in, because I, I believe in that, and I, I don't think that should be a gender thing. I believe in that. But uh, what I started to do was work hard to get more women at the table where the decisions were made. Uh, and that was, that was pretty early on. I mean, as early as the 90s, when I started to get involved in a higher level organization like the McLeod uh, leadership campaign. That was 1992. 92, do, 91, 92. Yeah, do, do, you think that, do you think that impression has been broken yet of, of women not having as, the same seat at the table that men have? I think it's come a long way, but not completely. There are still so many discussions where it's like, do we know any women we can get around the table? Do we know any, anybody that, uh, you know, anybody we can ask to join a committee or take on a role? And it's still, and particularly when we try to find people to run. Uh, every campaign works very hard, I would say, in every party to find women, but that's still a major topic. It doesn't happen naturally. Mm. Pat, you've got a reputation out there. You know you do. You talk about it in the book all the yeah, time. You yeah. became one of the best in the business at managing and winning campaigns, and yet one time when a candidate was in trouble, somebody said, send in the bitch, yeah. and they meant you. Yeah. Um, another person once asked you, how many people did you make cry today? How did you get this reputation as a tough, take-no-prisoners, do-whatever-it-takes-to-win kind of person? So let me first be clear that when uh, the person said send in the send in the bitch, it was uh, actually I said as a compliment because in those days that wasn't necessarily seen as bad. It meant to be tough and would get the job done. It, it came from uh, being the person that you could call on to get the job done. It came from, but, but the jobs were never easy, right? It, it was politics and there was a lot to get done and you had to push, push through. And I found that in my early days, I realized quickly and early that um, people thought politics should just be chaotic. It was okay because it was politics and you couldn't, you couldn't push through that way. So I, I was a big political processes. I believed you could have process and protocol no matter where you were. So I worked hard to, to put that into place. People weren't used to it. And so there would be all sorts of levels of reactions. Some people responded well and, and did better in those environments. Some people were like, what, what, what do you mean I have to show up to work on time? Or I have to call you if I'm going to be late or I can, can't do whatever I want in a meeting. So that's where that reputation started to grow from. And then, of course, it was hard driving in the big campaigns. There was no way around it. Mm. You often heard people say, you know, people would like you better if you were a little nicer to them. Why weren't you nicer to people? 
Well, it wasn't that I wasn't trying to be nice to people. Uh, I just held people to account. My well, I asked people to take on responsibility, and if they did, then they, in the end, were accountable for that responsibility. That's how I lived in politics, and that's what I needed from others. Uh, the reason, a big part of the reason we got those ground campaigns, like the 2014 campaign, done at the level we did, was because there was no room for mistakes. And it, it wasn't about being nice or getting friends. It was about, again, getting it done. Here's how you describe it in the book. Mediocrity does not win elections. Yeah. Organization and discipline are non-negotiable. As my reputation for being tough and demanding had taken root, I thought of women who face similar challenges. When we won, we were heroes, and everyone loved us. When we lost, we were demanding bitches who ran roughshod over people. How much of that double standard do you think still exists in politics? I, I believe it still exists fully. Uh, I think there's still a, a expectation that women will be just that little bit nicer, will overlook the concerns, will, you know, draw back rather than go into conflict. I, you know, a lot of people are conflict diverse. I'm not. I take it head on and, and you get a reputation as a result of that. But you also get a reputation as a doer. So it's, it's very much still there. Although, interestingly enough, there are numerous, and I mean numerous examples, where you tell stories in this book where you say... And I ended up in tears because of it. Yeah. Do we have the wrong impression of you? Are, are you a lot softer than people think? Because you cry a lot in this book. Yeah, that's what a couple of <laughs> friends have pointed out, the crying in the book. And I, I, the reason I really made um, an effort in Let Em Howell to talk about that aspect of it is because it was... It's really important for people to understand that, you know, you can be this tough general and you could be commanding the army on the field, but you're still a human being who's taking blow after blow as people say these types of things to you and as you uh, experience uh, being told you're not gonna get the job that you'd hoped you were get, that you thought you'd earned, you're still gonna go home and be a human being. And, and had, so I wanted, I wanted to communicate to the, in terms of the young people that might read this that it's, it's okay to have some tough moments along the way and cry your way through them, but keep going. Someone once described you as a piece of chocolate. You are hard on the outside, but soft on the inside. True? Well, yeah. I. I I try to work to the, you know, some people might grin at this, but, you know, hard on problems, soft on people. So if there was a problem, if there was a hurdle, I would drive right through that. But I try to always remember about the people in behind that. You know, Christine Hart and I, if I can just tell you a quick story, had a discussion about the story uh, recently, about the story there about her giving me the flowers and saying you probably don't even like flowers. But we, that We should just explain. She was oh, a candidate for yeah. you in the 86 by-election in York by East, I think? Okay. Right, yeah. And, um, you know, it was, it was a tough campaign. It was David Peterson's first campaign. Uh, by-election campaign after he'd won uh, in 85 unexpectedly. We were pushing to an 87 campaign and it was important she went and there was a, and she was not, she was new to politics. Um, I was, you know, the one that went in there to finish the job of campaign manager. And we talked about it recently and she said, I never did see that soft side, right? Like she, because we did, we drove through the campaign every single day. And, and you yeah, guys were at uh, and, Hammer and Tong a lot of the time. Yeah, and you know, but we're good friends to this day. <laughs> It is unusual for insiders to dish publicly about yeah. cabinet choices, but you do. And after Dalton McGuinty left and Kathleen Wynne took over as Premier, Premier Wynne demoted significantly somebody who you were close to in politics, the former Education Minister, Laurel Broughton, yeah. who did some really tough stuff to the teacher unions and yeah. um, you know, left a bad taste in a lot of people's mouth. Anyway, Premier Wynne didn't put her in cabinet but gave her a very junior role, and here's what you said. I was shocked that Premier Wynne had demoted one of the smartest, most capable women I had ever met in politics. She put her need to demonstrate to the teacher unions that she had punished those responsible for the last round of negotiations ahead of finding a way to keep a strong, successful woman in politics. As it turned out, Broughton not only left politics, she left the province. She really bugged out. Why did you feel the need to tell that story? The reason I told that specific story is because um, what I was trying to, to, continue to continually go back to was the story of women in politics. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I look, at the, there were many reasons that Kathleen Wynne made that decision, and, you know, including there were people that needed to go into cabinet from her point of view who had, who had supported her, who were part of her team. Um, but, for, but for me, um, that was a moment where you know, do you, do you stay and support the, this very senior woman who had done some great things for the province, in my view, or do you, or do you, um, you know, how do I say it, make it, uh, you know, play out whatever you needed to do in terms of she had another, another mm -hmm. issue to address, and that was what was happening in the leadership around the unions, around the, the trouble that was being caused. That was, that was a difficult time for everybody. Mm -hmm. 
So, you know, I, I told the story because I think it is a moment where the decision could have gone either way. And it was my hope that Kathleen Wynne, who I think is remarkable and obviously was shattered the glass ceiling for women in politics, um, it was a moment that I, that I felt some disappointment. In the lead up to the 2014 campaign, I guess we should say, Wynne becomes, she becomes liberal leader in 2013. She goes to the polls in 14. Uh, you, you won a majority government in that campaign. You ran that campaign. You had the title... What was your title? You were campaign, campaign director. Campaign director. Yeah, you wanted that title, right? I that wanted was, that title. That was important to you to be called the campaign director. Right. Did you have the authority that went along with what that title implied? In the 2014 campaign, I definitely had that authority. Yeah. And uh, the David Hurley, who I worked with as the uh, campaign, he was called the managing co-chair. Um, he gave me, after some negotiations, that title because it, it needed to express authority. And that's what I say a lot about women in politics. Don't take the lesser title. Don't settle for less because you need to have, you know, for women, they need to be able to show authority and titles big in that. And in the Win majority government, you were deputy chief of staff in the premier's office and yeah. chief operating officer in right. the premier's office. Right. Again, did you have authority with those titles? Y yes, I had, I had some authority uh, in the early days. It was chief operating officer in a government role is, is a little tough in a central, in a centralized organization is a little tough. Um, but yes, generally I, I would say I had the authority I needed in certain areas, let okay. me put it that way. I mean, That's the just, a tougher question the, is what happened. <clears throat> I guess we're, what I'm trying to explore here is whether even in an office where the woman is a premier, yep. excuse me, even in an office where the premier is a woman, where the deputy premier is a woman, where yep. the minister of health is a woman, um, you know, where the attorney, um, no, not the attorney general, the education minister is a woman. There were women who were at the top leadership positions yep. in this government. Yep. Did it feel to you like women had equal voice in that government? In a lot of the, in a lot, yes, often, um, mm -hmm. depending on the on the debate on the table. Um, but in terms of the ultimate decision making, I would say that the most senior staff, Tom Tien and Andrew Bevan, had the largest share of that. Um, but I don't think that was necessarily completely a, a male female thing. I was just just think that was the trusted team around, right? So there were many tables that. I was lucky to be at, and some tables I wasn't at. And the same when it involved campaign, then, you know, David Hurley and, and others, Tom Murphy or Tim Murphy would be at the at the table too, right? Can we talk about your biggest nightmare in public life, Sudbury by-election? Oh, I thought we were going to say being on TV, but yeah. <laughs> no, this this can't be the biggest nightmare in your life. No, for sure. Yes, Let's set this up. Okay, so Win wins the majority in 2014. Uh, in 2015, there's a by-election in Sudbury. Um, the premier decides that she wants a different candidate than the one who had run for her right. in 2014. Right. And basically, you're on the case. What was your mission in that whole thing? Well, the first part of the mission was to actually get Glenn Thibault to say yes. Um, so this Glenn was the NDP MP for the riding of Sudbury, and he, through local people, had expressed an interest. Uh, we jumped all over that and, uh, first of all, had to convince Glenn to run. And we were able to do that. By December 11, 2014, he was our candidate. The next step was to tell the two local people interested, Andrew Olivier, the former candidate, and Marianne Matichuk, uh, that we had made the decision to go with Glenn, and he, he would be uh, he would be the candidate. Matichuk was okay with it. Olivier was not. Very much not. Right. He famously now recorded. He's a quadriplegic, so yes. he can't take notes. Yes. So he records yes. phone conversations that he has with people, and he recorded you on a conversation. Right. Is there anything as you look back on that conversation that you think you said that was problematic? Well, I, as I try to explain in uh, Let Them Howl, as I certainly explained to the OPP and to anyone who would listen at the time, which, which wasn't many once it got, got so uh, controversial, was that really this was one of the moments, as I think I say in the book, that Deb Matthews said, you know, listen to the tape because you'll hear a kinder, gentler Pat Sabera than you're used to. Because I, I really did feel that Andrew was struggling with the whole concept, that he, he just couldn't have the, you know, have the nomination and why we would do this. So... But more so, th th it would be a moment where I would say my, my work in campaigns and my work in government kind of overlapped in my head because Andrew was such a perfect candidate for many number of things, like he's a francophone, you know, he's from the north, relatively young man, new finances. You know, you don't always get a package like that. Mm -hmm. So I was trying to say to him there, based on that, there are so many things you could do. Don't feel, don't take this loss as somehow you're being shoved out into the cold. Um, so I would say that, you know, about the 18-minute six-second mark, 
I crossed that line, and, uh, How so? and that's when well, that's when I started talking about what he could do, could have done at the government, what he could consider doing at the government level, and that's that's the appointment process, right? And that's when uh, people jumped on that and suggested that I was promising him an appointment. Uh, he didn't offer a specific run. job, though. I, I wasn't even close in my head to mm -hmm. offering a specific job. I really was, in my mind, speaking in generalities about opportunities. So when you found out that you were being charged under the Elections Act with, do we call it a crime? Uh, yeah, it was under it was mm -hmm. under the Elections Act. It was a regulatory. So what'd you think? Well, we were we were pretty shocked. We thought, uh, and I say we because I had all these lawyers who were helping, and of course uh, the premier and the senior staff who were very supportive through this whole process. Um, I, I, what, what I couldn't ever get to ground on was why, and when we saw a trial that there was absolutely no evidence, why, why we could never get the OPP and the chief electoral officer to see it differently. It felt very political, as you will recall, mm -hmm. hours and hours and question period being asked about the Sudbury by-election, so many articles. Um, so I think, I think they just, uh, as I say, couldn't do the brave thing, admit they didn't have the evidence and step back. They decided to let the judge decide. Well, and it did go to trial and you know, evidence was introduced in court and the case folded in front of everybody's eyes uh, and you were ultimately acquitted. What was that day like? Well, uh, I, want, I want to say there wasn't actually any evidence presented because there wasn't any, but um, I think, um, you know, within a few days, as you say, we started to see that, there, that it was going to go the way we needed it to and, as, and, and it was a directed verdict where the judge just simply threw the charges out of court mm -hmm. at his first opportunity. We didn't have to have to put up a defense. But boy, it had been such a long haul leading up to that moment, and uh, the emotional side just took over. I, I tried to explain it well, and I've had a few people say that that's a pretty moving part of the book, where I talk about what that was like sitting at the table and turning to my lawyer, Aaron Dan, and saying, it's over, it's really over. Like, that that was my overwhelming moment. It, you can even make me feel emotional at any time I say that, because... You know, that's when I leaned on all those lessons. That's when I knew I could get through it because um, I, I knew what I believed. I knew what I, what I, why I had done what I'd done. It, it just was finally took the judge to convince them that I, what I had done and why I had done it was he would support that. He was, he was in agreement with that. That, uh, how do I put this? The worst in some respects was yet to come in as much as when the charges were laid, you stepped aside from your role in Premier Wynne's of office. Yes, of course. The campaign team that they had put in place to get ready for the 2018 campaign kind of coalesced at that time yeah. in your absence. Yeah. And once you dealt with all of those charges, the attempt to introduce you back into the campaign team did not go well, so much so that they said, if she's back, we're going to quit. Yeah. What did you think when you heard that? Well, if I can back it up just a little bit, the day mm -hmm. the, of the uh, the day of the acquittal, the day the charges were thrown out, the Ontario Liberal Party issued a press release saying we welcome Pat Sabera back to the campaign. Uh, I didn't know that was coming. It was a lovely thing, and in fact, that night it was a big part of our celebration. All that whole time I was away, I, I never understood other than that I'd be going back into the role of campaign director and and chief executive officer of the Ontario Liberal Party. So it was a pretty big shock to me when. Conversation started about the fact that that uh, I wouldn't I would be back in the campaign, but not in those roles. What became highly problematic was how much authority I would have. And again, with everything we've talked about in terms of this hard driving, get the job done personality and the way I do things, lacking the authority in what would be a very tough campaign, uh, I wasn't I wasn't prepared to take on a lesser role, and that's where the debate started. So it was it was very tough. It was probably in some ways tougher than the campaign because I. I couldn't put together uh, what had happened in that in that time. These were your friends, after all, who were telling you, "We don't want you back." Well, they weren't telling they weren't telling, they were telling me you, over that period of time. Uh, hmm. Then, in the in the larger conversations, it was it was being said, yeah, that they didn't want me back in in that role. Let hmm. me put it that way. They were prepared to kick me upstairs. I, I wasn't prepared to go there. Can you put us in the room? You and Premier Wynne had a one on one meeting. At yeah. which time, she said. I, I don't want to fire you, but you can't come back in your previous role. How, did, yeah. how was all that? You know, I, I want to say uh, how grateful I was the way Premier Wynne handled it. First of all, she handled it directly and herself. She, she left Cabinet to come over to me so that I didn't have to run the Cabinet gauntlet um, and the media and whatnot who would be gathered outside the office. Uh, and she just came in and sat down and, you know, I could tell it was, it was tearing both of us apart, right? She had fought very hard for me to stay. 
and I had fought hard to stay, uh, but it just wasn't gonna, it, she had to make a decision. Uh, I feel very badly about the place she was put into. She had made the decision she'd made. So when she said, um, I need that resignation, um, I said, well, I'm not going to resign because for me, this is now a line on how the party, how the party sees it. I want, I want to come back and fight for the party and for the next election, it was no longer just about Kathleen Wynne or the senior staff. Um, so she said, well, I'm certainly not gonna fire you, but that's when we agreed that it was about the fact that it, a different team had coalesced and, and uh, there was no way back in for me. So it was very tough, very emotional. We were both crying. Um, but, you know, I, as I said in the tweets I sent afterward, um, I, was, I was sad and very disappointed in the decision, but I defend to this day her right to make it. And she made the best decision that, that she, she made the best decision she could under the circumstances. The 2018 campaign, needless to say, was uh, the worst result for the Liberal Party in Ontario history. Yeah. Would it have been any different had you been at the helm? Well, I, I'm actually not, uh, some might suggest so, but I'm not so arrogant just to say that. But I think what I, what I would say instead is that I would have approached the campaign differently. Uh, and I talk about it and let them howl because there were two ways of going into it. And, and you know, David Hurley, the managing co-chair, and I had this discussion many times. Uh, you can fight to win the whole darn thing, and that's what they decided to do. Or you go in knowing that, as I said, for two years, we'd, our numbers had suggested we weren't going to come through it that well. Uh, so you go in trying to save the furniture. And I, I know what I would have done is pick the ridings that I felt we targeted closely, the ridings I felt we could have still won, and then ran them basically as individual by-elections or, you know, really focused on those ridings so that we could at least come through with party status and hopefully beyond. Like, you could start that way and then it can grow. Mm -hmm. Um, but if you start big, it's hard to pull back into those ridings. So it's really a difference in style and maybe maybe reality. How shocked were you when you saw that the party came back with only seven seats? Oh, I, I, I was pretty shocked. I mean, although I'd been talking to people and I, I knew what the numbers were saying, that it was looking pretty rough But um, to that point. But I still, I, I just didn't believe we wouldn't get party status. I mean, we're, we're the Ontario Liberal Party, right? That was pretty shocking. Mm -hmm. It's interesting. There's tons of discussion, of course, about why the Liberal Party under Kathleen Wynne lost so badly in that election in 2018. And one of the things that we hear speculated on a lot is that people at a certain point, a lot of the things that, that irritated them about Kathleen Wynne this time apparently didn't the first time when she won a majority government, whether it's sexual orientation or a school marmish way of, of uh, communicating things. Mm -hmm. There was the Hydra One issue, uh, mm -hmm. the partial privatization of that. Uh, what do you put it down to? What was the most important reason you think well, it, it is totally my, I, have, I guess I have two parts, mm -hmm. a two-part answer. Um, and in talking to uh, senior people in other parties, we talked about political life cycle. And again, I talk about it and let them howl. Like 14 years and eight months is a long time for any government. Uh, and it, so it wasn't just Kathleen Wynne. It was, it was a Dalton McGuinty government led into a Kathleen Wynne government, but it was a long time. And I think no matter what, the cycle was coming to its end. We shouldn't, they say we shouldn't have won in 2011, right? We shouldn't mm -hmm. have won in 2014. So pulling off 2018 was going to be pretty momentous if we could do that. Um, and it, that's why we talk about how tough of a campaign that was going to be regardless. So I think that's a big part of it, uh, that, that we, weren't going to, we weren't going to win another change mandate. But the second part of it, so I don't, I don't believe any of that related to her being a woman or a lesbian or anything of that. Um, but I think as I talk about, and. I wish there was a way to get to ground to this better, but the expectations around Kathleen as the premier, this is where I think the woman thing did come into it, and that people seem to have a different expectation of Kathleen Wynne. Like we won 2014 by saying she would be the change that they were looking for. And then in the end, um, based on kind of governing the way every other government governs, they didn't see that change. Mm -hmm. And then they, and then the voters said, okay, that's, we gave you another chance. We didn't get what we expected, even though they had a lot of trouble articulating exactly what it was they expected. Um, and therefore, we're not, we're not going to go another round with the Liberals. That's, that's what I put it down to. In our last couple of minutes here, I want to touch on two more things. Another thing that runs through the book is the notion of loyalty. And I wonder if you are concerned that people are going to think that you've been disloyal by telling so many tales out of school here. So I, I don't think I would have ever told these tales um, until the government ended. But, you know, so, so the book is about political staff, right? It's dedicated to political staff. It's the life of a political staffer in behind. And when I was at home and after leaving the campaign in 2018, thinking about all this, what sustained me was actually starting to write down these lessons, things I'd learned over, and that I could pass along that in terms of whether I was mentoring young people coming into it. That, and that's the feedback I've been getting. 
So yes, it's an open, honest, full account. It couldn't write it as a partial account. It would have not had the same impact or, or made. Uh, so I know while there are some people upset with the stories, the, if, I hope people read that from beginning to end and understand that it is more about uh, using my stories and my what happened to me as a way to talk about what it's really like for political staff that are caught between the civil service and the politicians and do the real work every single day. Mm. So that was my only way to get to that reality and that story. There's over 70 lessons in there, mm. you know, where that I would like to pass along and have people think about, particularly young women in politics. I don't think pulling my punches would have got me there the same way. Have you done your last campaign? I have probably done my last partisan campaign. I mean, I am in politics, so you never say never, but uh, I've probably done my last partisan campaign, but I still am hoping to find a way to do uh, more in politics around particularly getting women, uh, progressive women, uh, to be at the table. And do you want to explain the title? Well, uh, thank you. Let Em Howell <laughs> is, um, came from the Nellie McClung quote, um, Never, never apologize, never retreat, never explain, get the thing done and let them howl. So the get the thing done part is what, no matter what people said about me, I was still always the person they wanted to call if they needed to get the job done. Um, but the let them howl was really about, regardless of all that I'd been through, I didn't, I didn't fall apart in the end of the day. I lived to tell my tale and, and um, you know, I'm, I'm proud of my history in politics and that's as much as what I wanted to communicate. Your publisher is going to be thrilled with you because I think you mentioned the title of the book about 10 times in that interview. Oh, thank you. So yes, yes. <laughs> they will be satisfied. Yeah. It's a great read for people who want to know what's going on in the back rooms of politics. It's called, in case uh, you're yeah. not sure, Let Him Howl, Lessons from a Life in Backroom <laughs> Politics. Pat Sorbera. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Steve. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.